And we are live here, Dr. J in the house with Evan Brand. Evan, how are we doing, man? How's your day going? Life is good. How are you doing? Very good. First podcast officially as a dad. Feels okay. really good, Re really rewarding. A little bit sleep deprived. My wife's taking the brunt of it, but I'm doing my best to uh, be a supporting of a, hus a very supporting husband, providing all the nutrition she needs, cooking all of her meals. We got a little fridge right outside the baby's room put upstairs. And um, I got it stocked with bone broth, kombucha, <coughs> sparkling mineral water, uh, filtered water, electrolyte enhanced. She's got a handful of meals, paleo meals already prepared. She's got some really good healthy snacks. She's got some collagen smoothies and shakes up there. So I got her like stocked up. So I'm, my goal is to try to feed the baby uh, kind of proxy, right? Getting all the nutrition she needs. And then therefore she can take it in as easy as possible and then provide the best nutrition for the baby. Absolutely, man. Well, congratulations. I'm super happy for you. It's been a, it's been a long time coming. When you're waiting for stuff like this, a day feels like a week, and a week feels like a year. So yeah, and the baby's name is Aiden Raymond Marcajani, and Aiden means little fire. So little boy, we're really, really stoked to have him, and we're just trying to provide him a, as much nutrition as possible. He was in the NICU for a day and a quarter, day and a, maybe two days, I should say. He had a slight collapse lung at birth. He was doing great. And then as soon as the cord was cut, which we tried to, to delay clamping as much as possible, but it's a C-section, right? So like, you know, while the baby's got the cord attached, you know, mom's cut open bleeding, right? So we, they're kind of weighing out the benefits. Normally we'd wait uh, till the cord would pulse till it's white, you know, go white and such, which maybe would be 10 minutes or so. We didn't quite have that luxury. So we, you know, framed it up with the OB ahead of time. We delayed it as long as we could. And then as soon as that core was cut, he crashed. His O2 oxygen levels dropped. So they put a CPAP on him. They got his O2 up. They ran a chest X-ray right after. There's a slight right collapse lung, but in a day and a quarter, day and a half, healed. Wow. So he was super, super resilient. And we just, you know, we have to contribute the fact that my wife's nutrition and sleep and all that stuff was just really great during her pregnancy. And that probably attributed to his resilience. I'm glad it all worked out and you guys are yeah. home safe. Yeah. I mean, the NICU docs were pretty, I think, very shocked. They were telling me we could be in there up to three weeks and it was like two days. <laughs> wow. So it's pretty great to see that. Yeah, so the people are probably like, well, what happened? You know, you guys talk so much about holistic stuff. Why a C-section? Do you care to elaborate oh, yeah, on some yeah, of that? Let's talk about that. I've talked about it in other podcasts and other episodes, but people may not have listened to everything. So we'll we'll kind of make it so it, it all connects. My wife had a large fibroid removed about a year and a half ago, about the size of a baby's head. It was a very big fibroid. She'd taken birth control pills for 15 years, you know, into her late teens, into her early 30s. When Is that I met what you her, think caused it? I think that's a contributing factor. If you listen to my podcast with Dr. Horowitz, he's a fibroid expert, and, and he says that you know estrogen-dominant states can definitely drive fibroid growth. There's not a lot of research on it. I don't think there's going to there's be a lot of motivation to do a lot of research on it, but we know estrogen dominance can cause things like fibroids to happen. And then the question is, well, what can drive estrogen dominance, right? We know stress drives it. We know xenoestrogens drive it. We know phytoestrogens, right? We know lo low progesterone states can drive it. We also know birth control pills can drive estrogen dominance, right? So it's the milieu, the hormonal milieu. And then also just not getting pregnant, getting pregnant later in life can also drive it because when you get pregnant, you're really driving a progesterone dominant state and then breastfeeding, right? You're keeping progesterone levels really high too. So my wife got pregnant at age 40 and we decided that to get the fibroid removed just because one, it was so big. And number two, we just have a smaller fertility window. Yep. Right? The fertility window is a lot smaller and if we can get that fibroid removed, we can get pregnant like that. And again, her hormones were that of a young 30 year old woman. So we had done work with her, helping her hormones PMS, all that was really good. So her hormones were that of someone 10 years younger. She just had this big fibroid, which acted like an IUD, right? Wow. Intrauterine device, which basically just imagine this fibroid there just sucking up blood flow. So then when an egg comes in, it's not going to be able to stick because there's not enough blood flow to sustain it, right? So as soon as that fibroid was removed, we got pregnant two weeks after it was moved. And the doctor was like, hey, you know, you can try, but he kind of wasn't really expecting much. But as soon as we tried the first time, we got pregnant. 
and I we actually <laughs> yeah we actually um lost that baby but it was a blighted ovum so not necessarily a baby there was no like heartbeat or anything it was just a sack but we lost it which was tough but you know we just kind of attributed to the fact that she just went through a major surgery right she was under general anesthesia she was on pain meds it probably wasn't the best in time to right. try to get pregnant we only did because the doctor said it would be okay but then as soon as you know that the hcg dropped and she got her period back we tried again and then we got pregnant so wow. then that was the baby we have now aiden so awesome. we're very stoked so the reason why we had to do the c-section kind of coming back is because the incision was along the posterior section of the uterus which had kind of weakened the uterus which had kind of increased her chance of a uterine rupture and because of that increased chance of a uterine rupture if the uterus ruptures, you know, baby and mom can die. So they had to pull the baby out four weeks sooner, week 36, just to ensure that uterus wouldn't rupture. It's only a 1% chance, but, you know, we spoke to midwives and OBs, and, and no one recommended, no one would even do a natural oh, wow. birth just because of the liability was so high. But I was able to watch the whole entire surgery, and I literally saw, you know, them pull my wife's uterus out and – and I literally, you know, they had her uterus in her hand and I was like, hey, can you look at the backside? This is after the baby was born. Can you check out the backside? How's the posterior incision? Let's look at it. And she was like looking at it. She's like, I can't even see an incision. Jeez. So the uterus healed up so strong. And what I attribute that to is I had my wife on the true collagen. Every day she was doing about 30 grams of collagen every single day. And I know that those collagen amino acids had to have made a huge difference in helping to provide extra building blocks to the to her uterus to heal up. But they couldn't even see an incision in the back. Well, also you mentioned she had no stretch marks too, which is a pretty remarkable testimonial. Yeah. yeah, she had no stretch marks. Again, the baby came four weeks early, so some women will say, well, right. the, the stretch marks come that last two to four weeks. But again, my opinion, a lot of people are getting a lot of their protein from muscle meats, which is you know still good, but – Again, collagen is going to be connective tissue protein. That's ligaments, tendons, cartilage, hide, skin, right? So you're getting a lot more building blocks that are going to help the connective tissue and the skin and a lot of what's happening with the stretching of the skin and the fascia and all that tissue is going to be connective tissue based. So I think that providing one, lots of healthy fats and two, providing all the extra collagen peptides really help well, number one, her uterus heal, but number two, help the skin heal. And number three, I also think it will help um, the breast. A lot of women, their, their breast tissue kind of gets flattened and kind of, you know, really just kind of um, just flattened a bit. Maybe the, the breast will start sagging and hanging and such after a long time of breastfeeding. I think the connective tissue support will also help the integrity of the breast tissue as well. Ah, that's interesting. I, I believe there's probably going to be benefits. I mean, I wonder if we compared standard American women compared to hunter-gatherer women. Like, what was the difference in their skin quality? Probably a huge difference because the hunter-gatherers eating the marrow and the collagen and the bones and doing more stuff than than typical women do. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the the anthropomorphic kind of research, like they talk about literally like taking the organs and like harvesting them, and like the organs would be like literally given to the women that were fertile that were trying to get pregnant because they knew the organs were incredibly, you know, nutrient dense. And there's also research too; these women like would literally like give birth um, that that day, and they'd be back out in the field later on that day or that next day working. Wow, like it's crazy, right? I mean, they probably had a lot less stress in their life too, right? True. I mean, you know, very, very little stress, but still, I'm, it's amazing what the body is capable of, of doing. So that's just kind of like my backstory. So just kind of summarizing uh, history of fibroid. And there are natural ways to reduce fibroids. And I've seen them reduce and I've helped with those kind of situations in the past. We just, we're dealing with a time window, right? And if a woman's yeah. like in her 20s or early 30s and has a few years, hey, that may be a good thing to try. But in my opinion, um, you know, if you're up against a pregnancy window, getting it surgically removed is good. But if you listen to my interview with Dr. Horowitz, he's had women that he's removed the same fibroid three times. So what does that tell you? That just because you remove a fibroid, that does not fix the underlying issue of yeah. why that fibroid is growing anyway, right? That makes sense. So the birth control, for example, could have been one thing. Probably there's got to be an insulin component, my guess. There's probably an insulin component too. 
for sure. Sugar. It's probably just the toxicity component too, right? Because a lot of toxins, there's, you know, estrogenic compounds, yep. right? So there's some of that. So we're trying to do our best to support all that. And again, one of the protocols we'll be doing is using some systemic-based enzymes, serapeptidase, et cetera, to really help. This is one tiny fibroid still there. It's in and around the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube is still patent, so it's still open. And I literally was just like, you know, yelling at the OB, hey, can you check out our left fallopian tube? How's it look? She's like, oh, that little tiny fibroid, that, you know, half of a fingernail is still there on the fallopian tube, but it's not growing. So, you know, our goal is we're going to try to work on dissolving that one naturally, um, you know, over the next few years. That's amazing. So what had to be cut out and you couldn't just go in there with tweezers and yank it off or something. It's not that easy. Yeah, the fallopian tube's kind of a, you could, but you'd compromise the fallopian tube. Oh, wow. And the fallopian tube's still open, <clears throat> yeah. so it doesn't make sense. She had one little tiny fibroid actually um, there at the incision site of where they cut the uterus open to, to deliver the baby. So actually, she got a two for one. They removed that little little baby fibroid at the incision. Wow. So, did you see that? What did it look like? I mean, it's just, I got pictures of it, but um, yeah, it's just like a little, like a little mini golf ball. Really? And what, and what's the texture of it? It's kind of like, uh, it's fibrous. Oh, that makes it's sense. So, so like, um, let me try to think of a consistency. It's just, it's dense, but it's a slight bit of squishiness to it, but it's still yeah. dense. That makes sense. Yeah. That's so almost like a, almost like a tennis ball, like consistency. Yep. I like understand. there's some give to it, but it's still pretty firm. Yep. I understand. So, so that's kind of like the back, the back history on myself and my wife. But when you're looking at fertility, right, we look at a couple of things. Number one, how are the hormones, right? How are the hormones? Number two, how, how are the pipes, right? Uh, are the fallopian tubes open? How is the endometrial lining? Is it, is it okay for something to be able to, you know, implant there? And then number three is we look at the dad. How's the sperm count? Exactly. Motility, morphology. And I was actually really is my, my proud moment that I was rock solid on all those numbers. So I felt very, very good about that. Good. Just that's see, that's the problem. You know, you and I've worked with so many, so many women, primarily men aren't coming to us for fertility issues, but they have to come on board because it's part of the equation. And a lot of these women that we speak with, the men, they just have a terrible diet. So we may put the mom or the f the future mom on AIP, but then the dad's still eating ice cream and pizza. And then they end up at the, in, uh, what do they call it? The in vitro fertilization doctors who want to spend yeah. what's 10, 12, 15 grand but that may be unnecessary in most cases if we get the dad straightened out as well. Exactly. I mean, a lot of times, you know, what's going to affect the fertility is just number one, having a nutrient poor diet. So not having enough high quality nutrients like zinc and arginine and healthy fats and proteins. And then also um, mitochondrial support because sperm is needs mitochondria to move or needs uh, healthy mitochondrial nutrients to be able to, to kind of propel it, so to speak, right? So we have to make sure a lot of the good mitochondrial supports there. And then we're just not putting a bunch of toxins in there, right? Like we're avoiding the plastics, we're avoiding the pesticides, the chemicals, the Roundup, the glyphosate, all of these compounds that aren't going to be so good for it. Yeah, the endocrine disruptors, like you mentioned, like the plastics. So getting men and women off of Tupperware, I guess, by the way, if you haven't figured out this topic, we're, we're talking about fertility today. Since uh, Justin and I are both dads and our wives are both moms, this is a good topic for us that we've had firsthand experience on. So this is not theory. And there's also some science behind what we'll talk about. But the, the endocrine disruptors, you know, that can cause things like PCOS, which a lot of women that come to us, they've had PCOS previously, or they're trying to get help in reversing PCOS. That could be a huge, a huge hormonal function disruptor that can affect fertility. So we've got to get rid of the, the plastics. Plastic straws are a big one because your saliva, you know, in my opinion, you're breaking down that plastic a bit and you're absorbing some of the, the phthalates and the plastic softeners when you're chewing and using straws as toothpicks, that's not a good one. Uh, also you've got flooring too, like vinyl flooring. So if you're walking barefoot on a vinyl floor that, that's typically going to have phthalates in it, you've also got, um, issues with the men as well. They're, they're just as susceptible to exposure to phthalates and other type of toxins. You mentioned pesticides. So definitely going organic. If someone's a mom, a lot of times women, they've already had a first kid, but they want to have another kid and they're coming to you or I, we've seen that a lot too. And, you know, I tell a lot of moms, they've got to stay away from a lot of the 
playgrounds because they use the rubber tires, the recycled tire playgrounds, and those are very, very toxic. And I've measured moms with the GPL tox chemical profile test from Great Plains, and they've got their rubber toxins off the chart. And I say, where are you playing? And they say, oh, we go to one of those playgrounds with the recycled rubber tires. And that stuff is just super toxic. Or let's say the mom has a kid who started sports. Like uh, I worked with the woman last week who lived in London and her child, he was off the charts himself. So we haven't tested the mom yet, but we tested the kid because we're working more with him than her. And the kid was off the charts with 2,4-D, the Agent Orange chemical that they used in Vietnam. And I said, you know, where are you guys playing? And she goes, oh, he plays soccer. I said, is that football or is that soccer? You know, because she called it she called it football. I said, is that football, football, or is that soccer? And right. it was soccer. And so she's on the field with this kid multiple times a week. And the field is just sprayed, I'm sure, and pounds and pounds and pounds of glyphosate and, and 2,4-D. Yeah, I mean, I kind of go back and forth. Like, what's worse, right? Being on the artificial turf stuff or being on the grass? Because you know the grass is given a whole bunch of chemicals, right? I know. So I... For me, and again, I don't have any research. I'm just, a lot of what I do is common sense and based clinically. Yeah. Is I'd probably rather be on the synthetic turf grass because at least you know it's not being sprayed with Roundup yeah. and pesticides all the time. I know. Yeah, I don't think they spray right? anything. Uh, one, other, one other thing about men, you know, when we're talking about fertility for men, sperm quality, heavy metals is, is huge. Mercola had an article about infertility where he was talking about how men are much more susceptible to issues in their fertility with heavy metals than eggs. So the eggs and the female were less affected by heavy metals and other pollutants than men. So that's pretty interesting. A lot of guys have metal amalgams in their mouth. So we may, I've not personally had to go that far with any of my clients, but what would you say? Would you say that could be a possible step is the man have to may have to get amalgam removals done? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely an option if we're seeing elevations in heavy metals. I mean, anytime I have someone, a male with fertility issues, once the diet's good and we've eliminated toxin exposure, then it's about what nutrients can we add to enhance sperm quality and then what things can we add to enhance the toxification. It may right. be phase one or phase two to toxifying nutrients. It may be things to help push the heavy metal binding. So again, I'd want to look at all that. And if we're seeing high levels of metals and we know mercury's there and then we're seeing the person also has a history of fillings, heavy metal fillings, then we want to get that removed. Tap water. Got to have good, clean water that the person's drinking. We talked about the, the phthalates, so the xenoestrogens, because that's going to affect the male. Yeah. So if the male is more like a woman, you know, he's got a lot of excess breast tissue and things like that, then we can assume, okay, you've probably got some estrogen problems. So just like you mentioned about females, same thing for men. It could be an estrogen dominance problem. Yeah, and then we can look at that from two perspectives. I did a, a video called The Hormone Switch, so I recommend everyone take a look at that. We'll try to put links below for The Hormone Switch. But when men's blood sugar's off, when they start moving into a direction of insulin resistance, they – increase this enzyme called aromatase which causes their hormones to switch it'll cause their their testosterone to go more towards estrogen and we see that quite frequently and again one of the best things you can do is put on more muscle right put on more muscle that will make you more insulin sensitive whether it's a high intensity training type of regimen where you're doing like long slow movements to get muscle activation or to get hgh or where you're doing interval stuff that's going to help significantly. But get the blood sugar under control and get the inflammation under control. A lot of this stuff, we always go back to the foundation because we know there's people that are new that are listening every day. So we don't want to assume that the foundation is there. I know all, every, right. all of our patients that listen, all of our you know loyal listeners, they get that and they, we kind of feel like a broken record. But just to emphasize for new listeners here. Yeah, we want to get rid of dairy. I mean, that's going to be a huge one on the diet piece. When we're talking about stabilizing blood sugar, we're getting refined carbs out, we're getting sugars out, but dairy too. You know, depending on what piece of research you look at, that could be 60 to 70% of the estrogens consumed is coming from dairy, especially these cows that are not organic. So for us, the dairy is always, always going to come out. Organic veggies are always going to come in. Organic fats, 
your nuts, your seeds, your vegetables, unless the woman has some type of like Hashimoto's problem, which that can complicate things with fertility sometimes if there's a thyroid issue. But let's just assume that the person can do a good quality butter, some, can do some nuts, some seeds, maybe a little game meat even. That'd be cool if we could get the mom eating some, some deer or some type of game organ meats or sardines or yeah. other home-cooked, home-sourced wild turkey which we have a ton of turkeys here. Those are awesome too. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like local fish is an option here in Kentucky. I was reading the report by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. They said that most of the fish are toxic here, unfortunately, with the with high levels of mercury. So they said for people wanting to get pregnant or pregnant people should avoid the fish, which kind of sucks. But. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the fish component, um, I have an article that I give to my patients, but really it comes down to number one, trying to get the the wild, you know, the wild Alaskan or like some kind of flash frozen kind of wild fish I think is great, is ideal, but it's looking at the selenium to mercury ratio because fish are going to have a little bit of mercury. The question is, is there enough selenium to combat it? Because the selenium is a natural chelator of mercury. So just try to choose high selenium to mercury ratio fish. So skipjack tuna is going to be the best type of fish off the bat. Uh, cod, haddock, sole, halibut, you know, those things are good. And I have a good article in my members area for my patients. But if you just Google like high selenium to mercury ratio fish, you'll get a nice list there. Ah, cool. Yeah, I love cod, haddock. Those are awesome. I had something pulled up. I was trying to see. I, I may have lost it. But just mentioning the link between food sensitivities and also miscarriages. Basically, what happened is the link between having some type of allergenic reaction. You've got the cytokines that are basically suppressing the killer cells. Yep. But when the immune system's off, the body can accidentally attack the egg. So basically, long story short, it sounds like just searching, investigating, and finding out for food intolerances, which we're going to push most people into kind of a paleo template as a starting place. Probably no grains, but at least no gluten, no dairy as a starting place. We're probably going to rule a lot of those food intolerances out within the first month. Yeah, I even pushed to an autoimmune shtick as well. I know you talked about cutting the dairy out. I think that's good when you're doing an autoimmune shtick, but I think adding at least back in the ghee and then yeah, definitely potentially the butter, as long as you can tolerate it, as long as like either my patients, you're following the reintroduction protocol, which is adding the foods back in over a three-day period, gently increasing the amount. As long as there are no negative reactions, that's fine because, you know, butter, butyric acid is a, what, a six-carbon um, fatty acid. So it's a medium-chain triglyceride, so to speak, right? Because it, it's in that, you know, it's a very short chain length. It's four carbons or six carbons. But it's uh, a really good fat. It is a lot of nutrition, a lot of vitamin K, which is really, really good for fertility. Um, so that's a an excellent fat. As long as you can tolerate it, I think that's great. And How about again, other, ba other bad things too, like alcohol. Of course, like alcohol. Number one, it's a toxin. Again, in moderation, maybe okay. But number two, it gets metabolized to sugar. So if you have a little bit of insulin resistance or blood sugar stuff going on, that can be a stressor. Again, there's ways to hack it by just choosing higher quality alcohol and by timing it with protein and a little bit of fat. Uh, with your meals can slow down some of the absorption, but you know, for a time period, if you have health issues, cutting it out for a month or two may be a good idea to start with, and then choosing some of the drier, you know, white wines or a drier champagne or prosecco, or doing a really clean tequila or a really clean vodka. Again, my Dr. J Moscow Mule is one of my go-tos with uh, Tito's vodka and a ginger kombucha and some lime, or I just do a really good like a Chandon or like just a really good brute prosecco, very dry. I like the bubbles. Bubbles are, um, you know, the 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 uh, the seltzer or like the the CO two carbonation. The bubbles are actually there's actually research studies where they increase alcohol absorption with the bubbles. I was reading one study. I'm just like, damn, I'd love to be in this study. Like, you know, 15 years ago when I was in college, they were like, yeah, we had a group of college kids and we gave one group alcohol and one group alcohol with you know, carbonation and soda water. I'm like, that's a great study for college, right? And they're like, yeah, the group that got the carbonation with their alcohol, um, you know, felt the effects, felt the intoxication effects or the buzz, you know, the so-called buzz effects sooner. So there's that's some, so there's some research with the carbonation in there helping to absorb the alcohol. So what does that mean, right? It means you're a cheaper date, right? Yep. It means you need less of it to get that same buzz, which means less, toxicity on the liver. So that's why if I can add the bubbles in there, 
that's better. And you get that with my Dr. J. Moscow Mule. Uh, you can do it as well with my NorCal Margarita. And we just, you know, do a little bit of soda water in there. And you can also do it with a really dry uh, Chandon or Brut or Prosecco kind of drink there. Perfect. Let's talk about IVF just for a minute. A lot of people in, you know, the in vitro fertilization is like the first step. If they are struggling, diet, lifestyle, stopping smoking, I mean, which is insane. My wife had some friends that she's not friends with them anymore because they're just, they were not good people overall. So we, we cut them out. They were too toxic in many ways, emotionally, yeah. physically smoking cigarettes around her when she was pregnant, all sorts of crazy stuff. So we it's got amazing rid of those too. It, it's hard for someone to truly be emotionally balanced and healthy if they're not physically healthy because the mind body connection is just, it's so strong, right? Yeah, yep. I know. So anyway, but these people that used to be her friends, mm -hmm. The guy, the dad, they were struggling with years. I think they were in their, I think they were in their early thirties. They were struggling for years. They still do not have a child to this day. The guy was drinking beer almost every weekend, daily smoking of cigarettes, Mountain Dews, but yet they went to an in vitro fertilization doc and they were going to go spend ten or fifteen thousand for the therapy. I mean, that's yeah. just insane. You're not addressing the root cause. No, you're not. I mean, typically the first, you know, thing that they're going to do is they're going to do some kind of Clomid or FSH stimulating drug. The whole goal of that is to increase the eggs, increase the amount of eggs, right? So they'll do like some kind of clomiphene citrate or Clomid. And then depending on sperm quality, if the sperm count's low, they may do an IUI, which is like an interuterine insemination, kind of a fancy turkey baster. Yeah. Suck the sperm up. They may like wash it and stuff and pick the best ones. And then they'll inject it right into the uterus. So then there's no journey that these guys have to the sperm cells have to make to get up there, right? Because if they're already a little bit more mitochondrial depleted or they don't have good mort mortality, motility, like they're not moving in the right direction or their shape's not good, they may not be able to make the journey. So the whole idea is if we use that um, artificial turkey baster, you can get it right there so their journey is shorter, right? You're cutting their journey down by 80% and then they're stimulating the heck out of the eggs. That's the first step. And then the next step is full IVF, which is they're basically giving you drugs like Lupron to shut down your HPA G axis, you know, your hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis, and they're going to give drugs to stimulate FSH. Uh, they're going to give drugs to then manipulate ovulation, and then they'll probably give some kind of uh, progesterone afterwards to help hold the implantation of the egg. That's pretty much the cookbook. There are new medications that come in, gonadolav, folistim, lupron, all these different drugs may be used, um, but the goal is kind of the same. Stimulate, you know, egg production, enhance ovulation, uh, help hold on to um, progesterone levels so the egg sticks better. Well, I remember seeing a picture. I think it was a picture my wife had showed me where this couple had had hundreds of vials like an entire couch or an entire floor full of vials that had, had were daily injections, I believe, for that whole process, which this is, one, it's expensive. Two, that just doesn't sound very fun. And three, in a lot of cases, I don't have any numbers, so I'm not going to make up a number on the spot. But in so many cases, if you just address diet, lifestyle, infections, thyroid health, adrenal health, you, you're doing the fatty acids like you talked about, the collagens your zincs and seleniums and your natural folates and your vitamin C and your omega threes. It's like, that's a prescription that's going to have far higher success rates. And it's going to be virtually free because you have to eat to survive. So you're going to be eating all these good things anyway. Totally. And then we do things like chase tree and tribulus to modulate LH and FSH. So like that will modulate FSH with tribulus will modulate LH with chase tree. And these are things that help talk, help the brain talk to the end gonads, you know, and, and stimulate the follicle or help the progesterone, right? So we'll do that with some herbs. We can always create a cyclical augmentation protocol where we put estrogen, I'm sorry, progesterones in there, right? At certain times of the cycle, day 15 to 27. We can even add in some uterine supporting herbs like maca, motherwort, donkwai, alfalfa, yep. raspberry leaf extract. These are great uterine tonic herbs that really help the blood flow get to the uterus, which is good because that uterus needs adequate blood flow to help support that egg when it sticks. So I tell patients, think of progesterone as a sticky glue that helps the egg hold, but we need good uterine flow. That's why my wife and I had a hard time getting pregnant at first because we had this fibroid that was sucking a lot of the angiogenesis out, right? Angiogenesis is blood flow. So it was creating a lot of blood flow to the fibroid and not to whatever else was 
going to stick there, i.e. the egg, right? So, so did you all have to do herbs or did you do herbs or just the diet lifestyle is all you needed? Uh, we had herbs going in the background the whole time. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had that the whole time there. And um, we had a little bit of progesterone going as well. And again, we just, I measured it. Like I want 15 or higher, 20 is ideal. So like after she got pregnant, we measured progesterone. We made sure it was adequate and it was. So we pulled off it. And what were you doing? Like drops or and mm -hmm. cream? Progesterone or? drops. Mm -hmm. Drops, okay. Yep, exactly. So like typically like 100 milligrams is a good starting point once you get pregnant. And again, we just monitored it and it just kept on rocking. And again, if the HCG is high enough, typically the progesterone will be high enough because the HCG is um, going to be produced by, you know, the follicle and then also the placenta will kick in and produce it as well. And that HCG will then jack up the progesterone too. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't have to continue, you're saying? Correct. No, we didn't have to. But Perfect. some women that have lower progesterone, they may have to keep that progesterone going for the first trimester. Now, is that something you have to get via prescription or, or they're over-the-counter natural ones you can get? Depends. I mean, I'll typically give my sublingual one mm -hmm. until I can get the fertility OB to write one. Just more from a med legal standpoint, I'd rather have the OB write a bioidentical prescription just so, you know, if they're working with that person that we know it's covered. But the protocol is going to be the same. And typically, we'll do like an intervaginal um, progesterone, just so we know it's getting right to the tissue. It's, it's, it's being released closest to the tissue. So we'll do that if we have an option. Some OBs that they won't do it, um, just because they're not looking at the progesterone or because the woman doesn't have a, a, a history of miscarriage, they may not even want to look at it. But I mean, like, do you really want to go through a miscarriage to then know you're at risk to then wait to the next time to do it? No joke, right? No. Yeah, I, I'd rather be monitoring it and, you know, if it's below 15, you know, I'm going to be supplementing with some progesterone to make sure there's support there. You can't go wrong with it. Just make sure you're using good quality progesterone. Again, we're giving a lot of clinical advice here and there may be a lot of people that are just lay people listening. I don't recommend doing this by yourself. You really want to work with a provider that's done this a lot so um, you know what's going on and you want to have everything looked at. So you want to make sure that we're supporting the adrenals. Typically, once someone's pregnant, the only thing I will keep them on are nutrition, nutrients, whether it's nu vitamins, minerals, amino acids. I'll typically keep them on probiotics. I'll keep them on digestive support, HCL enzymes. And the only hormone I'll typically keep them on when they are pregnant, if it's necessary, underscore necessary, is the progesterone. Yep. Well said. I mean, that's the thing we love talking about adaptogens so much, but nobody's going to do the research on rhodiola or these other herbs and how they could impact the fetus. So we just, you know, we love those things, but we just can't safely recommend them because we just don't know. It's probably safe. But yeah. again, like think about it. Who's going to sign up for that study? I know. Right. Who's going to sign up? Hey, by the way, congrats, you're pregnant. Hey, we'd love to have you sign up for this study where we test these adaptogenic herbs on health and viability and uh, no, I'm good. You know? Right. So, I mean, some of it we can draw from from ancient peoples, what they've used. Like you mentioned the chase tree, which has been used a, an extremely long time. So a lot of it we've probably already lost due to just modern life. We've lost touch with our hunter-gatherers. What herbs and plants and trees and stuff did they use during pregnancy, unfortunately? But like you said, diet, lifestyle, foundations, HCL, enzymes, probiotics, fish oils, vitamin D. Did you hit, Did you mention that one? We did not, but vitamin D is definitely important. I have to look at potentially even giving my baby a little bit of extra. I was speaking to one of the the neonatal um, docs there, and he was telling me, you know, you may want to give your child an additional above and beyond what's in the breast milk, 400 IU sublingually um, for the baby. So we're looking at getting some extra bit of that, but, you know, we're going to weigh it out. If we can get the kid out there at 8 a.m. in the morning, 15 minutes out in the sun at 8 a.m., that may be enough right there. They don't even need the drops. Yeah, what what the lady we spoke with said, she said as long as my wife was getting six to 8,000 units, that which I think this is just probably her making up numbers on the spot, but she said that if my wife were supplementing with six to 8,000 units daily, that the baby would probably end up getting at least 500 to 1,000 units from that that would pass through. I think that too. I asked that. They, they were like, well, you they should still no give clue. it. They were like, you should still give it, but it was probably like a CYA comment. Like, exactly. hey, we don't know exactly, but I think if she's getting six to 10,000 a day, I think you're going to get 5% to transfer to the baby. I guarantee it. The breast milk. 
So I, it. I think it's probably good. So we're probably going to make sure she's just getting 10,000 a day with the K2 and then just get the kid out in the sun a couple times a week in those early morning hours and, you know, just enough to give him a little sun kiss, nothing else. Yep. Do you, do you want to talk about lab tests for a couple of minutes and just talk about yeah. what we would recommend someone get if before they even think about conceiving, you know, we kind of talk about pregnancy and birth and delivery and all that, but really it begins far before that. So, you know, I kind of talk a bit like a five or six trimester is really what pregnancy is because you've got to do the preparation and then the postnatal care is important too. So vitamin D we hit on that as, as a blood panel insulin or blood sugar. If you knew you had a history, you could get the stuff done. Uh, fasting insulin, the fasting insulin is great. We want less than seven, ideally less than five. We may even want to just do some functional glucose tolerance testing. I uh, just testing your blood sugar with a blood sugar meter fasting one hour, two hour, three hours after a meal, choose a couple of different meals, a couple times a week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some people will be higher in the morning because of the Samoji effect or the Dom phenomenon, which is totally cortisol driven. So you've got to keep that in mind. Yep. And then, um, I would say, you know, we're going to do an adrenal test for sure. And we may just do a female hormone test around day 20 where we're looking at estrogens and progesterones and such and testosterone. But if there's a more of a fertility history there, we may run what's called a month long test or run the 209 panel from BioHealth, which is a month long panel. Yeah. We'll look at progesterone levels starting at day two every other day in the cycle. Thyroid markers. You want to look for antibodies, your TPO, your TG antibodies, yeah. just see if there's mm -hmm. some autoimmunity yeah. going on. Yeah, if there's some history going on or symptoms, we'll definitely do it. But, you know, TSH, T4, T3, antibodies, reverse T3 is great. And, you know, one of the things that I gave my wife during pregnancy is a couple hundred extra micrograms of iodine a day. There's some good research on that helping the baby's IQ. So we did a Wait. little bit of that. I'd you use can have my a genius iodine. baby now. I mean, that, the goal is to give the kid all of it, all the resources it possibly can, right? That's yep. the goal of, you know, being a great mom and great dad is just giving your kid as much potential as possible. And a lot of that's going to be um, a healthy pregnancy, right? Healthy nutrition, healthy prenatal nutrition. So healthy fats, healthy protein, healthy carbs, nutrient density has to be high. Inflammation has to be low. And, um, making sure there's enough calories and, and good macros. So we're going to go on a little bit higher on the carbs right now, but this is truly when you eat for two. A hundred percent, man. Tell yeah. me uh, my this wife, really she, good. she ate way more than me and she's still, she actually weighs less now than she did before she got pregnant, which is interesting. I mean, it's a great it's, benefit of breastfeeding. It's definitely depleting though. It can be depleting. So we're doing our best to keep her, to keep her, uh, full and, and satiated. Yeah, we also did placenta encapsulation as well. Oh, sweet, man. Yep. Cool. I actually have pictures of her placenta. It's pretty cool. It's, yeah, I, I planted I planted my wife's with a tree. Really? Very well, I had cool. a little tree sprout, a little maple tree sprout at our old house. I had the placenta because we were going to do encapsulation. We had our, a doula that was going to do it for us, and we decided she, she felt so good postnatally that she didn't need it. And, and so I had the placenta in the freezer, took it out, thawed it so I could actually mold it first, you know, mold it a little bit and dug a, dug a giant hole, buried it a couple feet under with, uh, with a little maple sapling right there. So there should be a tree there one day. Wow. That's amazing. So yeah, we had it encapsulated. So she's doing three capsules three to four times a day. And then we have, um, we actually had a tincture made too, which is pretty cool. A placenta tincture. Yeah. And we're going to save that for menopause for her. Really? So when, she, when she transitions to menopause, we'll use that tincture. That's a trip. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I did not know that. What? So what's the idea there? There's going to be some naturally occurring hormones in the placenta that will help to mm -hmm. ease menopausal symptoms? Exactly. Ah, okay. We've got, um, we've got a couple questions. I think they may not be related to our topic because our topic's pretty niche today. But do you want to look at these questions here? Yeah, we'll try to grab the ones that are most relevant for sure. Okay. Uh, there was a person named Chris here that said he was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and is displaying signs of hypoglycemia with perfect blood sugar. What could it be? That's kind Again, of a question. Do you get that question? Yeah. So his blood sugar may look good, but why does it look good, right? The question is, are the adrenals coming to the rescue to make that blood sugar go up? Because mm -hmm. if the adrenals are coming to the rescue and lifting that blood sugar up, there's going to be a lot of cortisol and adrenaline in the background, which are going to create a lot of anxiety and mood issues and irritability and a lot of things where your blood sugar may look good, but the question is what's lifting that blood sugar up? Ideally, we want healthy blood sugar by diet, 
meal timing, nutritional density. So the blood sugar is lifted up naturally, not relying on the adrenals to keep it lifted. Yeah, which the adrenals are kind of the backup generator. So if the adrenals are getting involved with your blood sugar regulation, that's not good. That means something else is off elsewhere. But if the diagnosis of Hashimoto's is there too, could we say that if, if there's signs of hypoglycemia, maybe it's not hypoglycemia, maybe it's thyroid as well, because I mean, the thyroid can make you feel like you're fatigued and lethargy, and then all of a sudden you're overstimulated and totally. I mean, if you have hypo, if you have Hashimoto's, there's probably potentially some T4 to T3 conversion issues, yeah. and there's probably some adrenal issues. So all that stuff needs to be looked at. And then again, we don't even know where that this person is in the hierarchy of diet and lifestyle. So right. we're assuming that diet and lifestyle has already been adjusted. 30 grams of protein in the first 30 minutes of waking, eating eating healthy proteins, fats, and the right amount of carbs every four to five hours. We're assuming that that's already dialed in. Perf and preferably on an AIP approach until the antibodies are very, very minimal in the single digits or less. Yeah, if possible. I typically wait till there's a, a there's plateauing of uh, symptoms. Some people, we may not be able to get them all the way low, but you know, we at least want to get them under 500 or so. It depends. If we can get someone from 2000 under 500, that's a pretty good reduction. Yeah. Again, what's the highest depends. you've seen with TPO? I think the highest I've seen was like a 1600 on a TPO. I've seen over 2000. I mean, I've had patients literally go from over 2000 to under a hundred. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so what's I've seen the timeline? Different. Is that like a year? I've seen that happen in six months to a year. Yep. Yep. But my average person that I work with, we have at least a 50% reduction in antibodies. Right. That's awesome. I love seeing that on a piece yeah. of paper when you actually get to validate it, but then their symptoms are better too. It's, it's just a double win. Oh, and I had so many patients say their endocrinologist says there's nothing you can do about that. And I know. It just, it's like over and over again and we just continue to prove them wrong. And it's just like, man, it's a great feeling. You know, I feel so bad. It's just like, you know, imagine ha having someone like, you know, hiring someone to fix your house and all they have is just a hammer. It's like, dude, like you're missing the saw, you're missing the screwdriver, you're missing everything. It's like functional medicine is like we get so many tools at our disposal. We're not limited to just like that one pharmaceutical tool that's supposed to be in our toolbox, right? Yep. Well, and the same thing with the fertility question. I mean, you and I have talked to dozens and dozens of men and women who've been told that they'll never be able to have children, yet we've aided in many, many babies, you know, being made just by helping women get their hormones back online and fixing the underlying issues. So. That's it, man. I 100% agree. So let's I hope that helps there. Anything else we can grab before I jump on my next patient call? Yeah, let's see what we got here. That was unrelated questions. Someone's asking about probioflora and sacroflora. Again, that's, those are some of my probiotic products. Sacroflora is a high-dose saccharomyces. Probioflora is a high-dose bifido, lactobacillus, um, phage probiotic. Uh, we typically do that for at least 60 days after a parasite killing protocol. Here's a good here's a good question here from Naomi. She said she's been diagnosed with blastocystis hominis, which for those listening, that's a common parasite infection we see. She's exclusively breastfeeding a six month old, and the antibiotic metronidazole did not seem to work. Is it possible to treat while still feeding baby? The only way I would treat it is with probiotics. Right now, I would not do any herbs. Yeah. I would just do probiotics. I would do Saccharomyces and high dose probiotics. That's the only thing I would do right now to treat it. Yep. So, um, Naomi, when the time comes for you to wean off the baby, which if it's six months, this may be another year or so. We don't know how long you intend to breastfeed. At that time, reach back out to us, Justin or myself. We can help you get rid of the blasto using herbs. But yeah, with these antiparasitic herbs, we, we just it's just not not a safe. It might be safe, but we just don't know. We don't know if it that's probably safe. would be safe, but we don't want to chance it, and we just rather be very conservative. Right, always do no harm. So I feel very comfortable recommending probiotics. There's been studies on on kiddos actually looking at Saccharomyces boulardii uh, compared to Flagyl or Metronidazole in treating blasto, and it's just as good, if not better. Yep. So look it up, Saccharomyces boulardii. Check out Justin's. We both got Saccharomyces boulardii's products. There's a lot of good ones out there. Just make sure you get professional grade so that it actually yep. works. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, I think that's it, man. We can wrap it up. So we'll send people back to your site if they want to learn more about you or work with you, justinhealth.com, myself, evanbrand.com. Check us out. We've got hundreds and hundreds of episodes. So if we just hit the surface of one piece of the conversation you like today, then I'm sure we've dove deep somewhere else. And give us a review. I know you may be watching elsewhere, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, but iTunes is where it counts. So we need to continue to beat out people like Jillian Michaels who promotes just not 
sound advice. And so we, we want to really bring functional medicine to the forefront of humanity and help to s save some of the crises that are going on in terms of depression, anxiety, infertility, obesity, diabetes, cancer. We want to put a dent in the universe. So give us a review so that we can do that and stay in the top of the charts. Awesome. And guys, subscribe right now. My YouTube, justinhealth.com, Evan's YouTube, right? Go to a site, click on the YouTube link. We appreciate the subscriptions. Care, you know, sharing is caring. We love it. And again, give us feedback. We want feedback about what you guys want to hear because this is all about how we can serve you guys better. So let us know so we can provide more awesome information. And again, what makes us different, what Evan and I different is we keep it real. You're going to walk away from our show and our podcast with actionable item, not some esoteric BS that kind of makes sense, you know, up in the ether, right? But what can you actually do? So that's how we're different. We're trying to keep it real and make it actionable for you guys. So we appreciate you listening and everyone have a great day. Take care. Take care.